back by October 29th, um, and we are thrilled to be able to partner together to sponsor 100 bags uh, for Thanksgiving this year. We would like to invite you to our Wednesday night dinner on October 18th, taking place from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., and we are excited to have this family fall festival full with hay rides, pumpkin painting, making boo bags, and more. We hope that you will join us, your family will join us, your friends will join us. Uh, it should be a great time. There are two ways that you can sign up for our Wednesday night dinner. First, you can sign up in the lobby. There's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby at the welcome desk, or you can sign up electronically via our newsletter. Additionally, we would love to invite you to our trunk or treat event happening on Sunday afternoon of October 29th. And this trunk or treat event is going to be taking place at the Shiloh Mobile Home Park here in Peachtree City. And so there are two ways that you can get involved with our Shiloh trunk or treat this year. The first way is you can sign up your car to, or your trunk more specifically, uh, to decorate that and take that over to Shiloh. Um, and there's a sign up sheet to sign up your trunk out in the lobby, but you can also sign up to attend and just hang out with the families and the kids at Shiloh. We would love for you to come and hang out with us on the 29th. Uh, there should be food available as well for that. Um, additionally, there is no middle school Sunday school meeting this morning during worship as we are about to take middle schoolers and high schoolers on a fall retreat after the service. So be praying for those students um, as we go away for a night. Uh, be praying that for safety and that they would encounter Jesus in real ways. And for our final announcement this morning, I'm going to welcome up Debbie Warren to share a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. Please welcome Debbie. Thank you very much. Good morning, Evergreen family. As many, oh, thanks. As many, of you, as many of you know, our church participates in the Operation Christmas Child program, whose goal is to place a shoebox gift in the hands of children in need all over the world. But what you may not realize is that along with this shoebox gift comes an opportunity to share the gospel of Christ with a child. Uh, shoebox recipients also receive an invitation to in, enroll in a program called The Greatest Journey. It's a dynamic follow-up discipleship program created just for them. Since 2009, 26.5 million children have uh, gone on to take this, this course that teaches them how to follow Jesus and how to share Jesus with others. Wow. And these children have gone on to pray for family and friends and share the love of God with them, and it's have wonderful results. You have new churches being birthed, and as a result, communities are being transformed. To highlight the good work of Operation Christmas Child, we have a brief video for you to enjoy. Let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them. For such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope 
that they have joy and it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. Last year, Evergreen packed 192 shoe boxes, and that's wonderful. But our hope, our prayer, is that God will touch your heart today and will work through this congregation so that we can reach even more children. Please, carefully consider packing a shoe box so that we can reach our goal of 250 shoe boxes this year. When? Um, in the weeks at the end of this service, you will find brochures in the lobby to, that will explain how to pack a quality shoe box. And please pick one up, read it, because inside it will tell you, it will give you detailed directions on just how to do that. Um, in, in weeks to come, we'll have pre-printed shoe boxes available for you to take home, pack, return to church, and those shoe boxes will then be dedicated on Sunday, November 12th. This is just prior to the uh, National Collection Week. Folks, you have the opportunity to change a life. Prayerfully, please prayerfully consider packing a shoe box to help us reach our goal. If you have further questions, feel free to reach out to Susan Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And Evergreen loves a challenge, so you heard it first today. 250 boxes is our goal. At this time, let us enter into a posture of worship, and let me welcome up Martha Phyllis to lead us in our liturgy this morning. Good morning. It is lovely to see all of you. Hear what Jesus has to say to his followers in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When we gather together to worship the Lord our God, we often forget that worship is an invitation to find rest in Jesus. As we're called into worship this morning, let us seek together the rest our souls desperately crave. If you're able, please stand with me as I start the call and response based on Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Amen. I remain standing and let's worship the Lord this morning. Crashing over 
break the walls apart Open the heavens, almighty God you are Overcome, defender of my heart By your power, the oceans open wide Your fire falls down The prayer of confession is a chance for us to come boldly before the throne of God's grace, to admit our brokenness and turn towards the Lord. This week's prayer will include two times of silence, once at the beginning and again at the end as we silently come before God in confession. Please pray silently with me. Lord, we come to you this morning aware of the ways in which our sin distorts our relationship with you and with one another. In both action and inaction, we have failed to love you with our whole beings, and we have failed to love our brothers and sisters the way you have called us to love them. Forgive us, Lord. Convict us of the ways in which we fail to demonstrate and live out of your eternal kingdom. Teach our hearts to follow you. Teach our lips to sing your praise once again. Have compassion and mercy on us so that our worship and praise may be directed towards you. We pause silently to confess now. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us claim the hope we have in Jesus in the assurance of pardon. I will start the call and response based on Romans 12. Let love be genuine. 
hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Be patient in suffering. Amen. Thank you. At this time, we would love to invite our children on forward for a time with younger Christians. They're already making their way up. Uh, and as they make their way up, will you turn to a neighbor and welcome them this morning? on there we go good morning everyone um i am loving this cold weather this morning and there are also some other things i am loving that come with the cold weather my kids and i went and did a corn maze this weekend we bought a pumpkin pumpkin spice lattes are out now are there some things that y'all do for the fall too what are some things oh, trick-or-treating trick we love doing that you do what you like to be funny? Yeah. It's fun to be funny in the fall, too. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things we do is we carve pumpkins at our house. Do y'all carve pumpkins? You do? So tell me, what are the steps when you carve a pumpkin? Henry, what's the first step? You cut the top out? Perfect. Okay, once you cut the top, then what do you do? Take the seeds out. You take all the seeds out. Right, good job. And then what? Take the guts out. The guts out, okay. Yes, the guts and the seeds, that's great. What else? And then you carve, well, you carve it? Like to get a sharpie, and then we color, you know, where we want the carve, and then we carve them. You trace first to be very precise, right? Do you do like old school face, or do you do like a very intricate Spider Man or your favorite person? Yeah, you have to cut just the right pieces or it, it can be a Pinterest fail. Oh, you got a seed. Yep. Okay, so why do you cut all that stuff out, though? What, what's the end result? What does it turn into? A jack-o'-lantern. It goes from a pumpkin to a jack-o'-lantern. And why? It's, this, it's the same thing he said, but it's cut. What else does it have inside of it? A candle. And what does that do? It makes it bright and it lets light shine throughout it. Yeah. 
So it goes from a pumpkin to a jack-o'-lantern because we clean everything out of it and we allow the light to shine through it. And you know what? The, I did. I messed it up. Sorry. Um, but what it made me think about was we are a lot like pumpkins. When we have Jesus inside our heart, he cleans all the bad stuff out of us. And once we get all that bad stuff out of us, his light can shine through us. And I don't know about y'all, but I have had a moment with Jesus where he cleaned everything out of me and made me new and made me different as well. And I bet you've probably talked to your mom and dad or grandparents or other people in your life, and they had a moment like that too. Um, But there's also this guy in the Bible, and his name was Saul, but then God cleaned everything out of him, and they started calling him Paul. And so we're going to talk about Paul today. It does rhyme. That's awesome. Um, And we're going to talk about that today. In the Bible, it's in the book of 2 Corinthians, which is an epistle. Do you all know what that means? That's a weird name. It, It means a letter. So this is a letter that Paul is writing to the town of Corinth. And I've got a volunteer that wants to read what he wrote to them today. So it's all in the yellow, okay? So far... So from now on, we don't look at anyone the way the world does. At one time, we looked at Christ in that way, but we don't anymore. When anyone lives in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All of this is from God. He brought us back from, to himself from, through Christ's death on the cross, and he has given us the task of bringing others back to him through Christ. God was bringing the world back to himself through Christ. He did not hold people's sin against them. God was trusted. God has trusted us with the message that people may be brought back to him. So we are Christ's official messengers. If it has, it has, it is as if God were making his appeal through us. Here is what Christ wants us to do to to beg you to do. Come back to God. Christ doesn't didn't have any sin, but God made him become sin for us. So we can be made right with God because of what Christ has done for us. Good job, Henry. Everybody give him a round of applause. That was so good. You did a really, you're a really good reader. Okay, so when, basically what Henry was saying and what Paul was saying is when we come to Jesus, we are a new creation. Kind of like the pumpkin. When you bring it home, it's just a pumpkin. But when you dig in it and you clean all the guts, as you said, out, and you put a light in it, it is a new creation. It becomes a jack-o'-lantern. And we are made new through Jesus uh, because he died and he rose again and our sins can be forgiven. But here's the thing, cleaning out the guts and the gunk isn't as easy as it seems. We're still sinful, but when we try and we trust in Jesus and we keep him in our heart, he's with us and he can help us in all situations and he can help us turn away and become new. All right, so um, we're going to pray. Does anybody want to say the prayer to end? No? Okay, I got this. Dear God, thank you so much for sending Jesus to die for our sins. We pray that you clean the sin out of our lives and make us into something new. I pray is that as we go out into our communities and back into our everyday lives, that we stand out and people notice us because we are different. And not because of anything we've done, but because how your light shines through us. Help us put others before ourselves and love people well. And let those around us see less of us and more of you. It's in his name I pray. Amen. All right. All right, as the kids exit, please stand with us. Let's continue praising our Lord and Savior. Oh, 
dark disaster and sing hallelujah through the pain. And even in the shadow of death, I will praise you. And even in the valleys, I will
Well, good morning. It is nice to see you all. Um, I think at the very beginning, we need to acknowledge it's been a little rough <laughs> lately, and though no one likes it when that happens, I think we all need to remember that our circumstances and even our feelings around circumstances never, ever changes the power, the goodness, and the love of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Neither does it change what the Lord has called us to do. And I am grateful for each one of you, and especially for those who have reached out over the last few weeks. Um, and um, I've felt your love, and I've felt your prayers, and I, and I really appreciate that. But it is now time to get back to work, yes? And we do have work to do this morning. Last night, I um, opened the, the news feed on my phone and saw what was going on in Israel. And I think whenever we encounter something like that, especially in that part of the world, I mean, part of the thought process is whose fault is this, right? And kind of my thought process is whose fault is it not? I mean, it's such a deep, impossible tragedy and mess. But I know that 
that last night and, and this morning and right now and later and on and on and on, there are people all over the world who are praying into this situation. And frankly, as we were singing, I, I kept thinking, we need to call on the power of God into the middle of this because there's, we don't have the solution. If we had the solution, we would already have implemented it. This is just one of those circumstances where, where clearly God must get involved. And so the very first place I want to start this morning um, is with a word of prayer for, um, for everyone involved, the people of Israel, the people of Gaza. I mean, um, I mean people who are here in the U.S. Who, who have family over there who are struggling. Um, so would you pray with me? I mean, God, there are, there are moments in this world that just leave us completely speechless and powerless, and we, we literally do not know. We do not know what to do or, or even what to pray, Lord, but, but it is easy enough for us to step into the pain of this situation for those who have lost loved ones already in this conflict. And Lord, we pray for those families and we pray, Lord, that your spirit would fall upon them and that, and that in some way you would begin the process of redemption. We pray, Lord, for those who believe that violence is the only way for them to be heard. And we pray, Lord, that, that, that you are already beginning the redemption of, of that thought process as well. We pray for the people of Gaza. We pray for the people of Israel. We pray for that entire section of the world. We pray for the entire globe, Lord. And we join our voices and our hearts and our spirits with those who are praying, even in this moment, for your shalom and your peace to fall upon this conflict. Lord, I pray that you would surprise us by your power and your mercy, and your grace. We pray, Lord, that, that cooler heads would prevail, and that somehow out of this, in a way that we cannot see or don't even really anticipate, that, Lord, something new will come. And so, Lord, we, we commit ourselves in this moment to continued prayer to stand before your throne intervening for for all the people who are involved we pray lord that your spirit and your angels and all of your might and power would come to bear upon this situation and we pray this in the name of jesus amen well we've been in this uh fall series called next door and austin has brilliantly continued on in this series, and this series has been all about the call that Jesus places on us to reach those around us with the good news of his kingdom. We need to remember that, that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross led us somewhere, that it transformed us. His sacrifice on the cross transformed us from these, from these desperate, earth-wandering lost, confused beggars to citizens of the kingdom. And even more than that, more than citizens of the kingdom, it has transformed us into children of the king. I mean, how good is that, that we can call the king of the kingdom both father and friend? Austin has told me some of the stories that you have told him about connecting with your neighbors. And I got to tell you, as I listen to these stories that he has shared with me about how you've connected in these sort of very real and genuine and, and abundant and authentic ways, it so warms my heart to hear that people are not just hearing the preaching, but they are actually 
acting on the preaching, that they're out there planting seeds with their neighbors, which with a little tending, one day might bloom into full-grown friendships and, dare I say it, an opportunity for real and abiding love. You see, every harvest begins with planting, and that's what you all have been doing is slowly but surely planting the seeds that one day either you or God will harvest. Now, we've tried to stay practical rather than theoretical in this series because, frankly, does anyone here really need another sermon on why you should love your neighbors? I mean, you've heard, I mean, if you've been around a church once or twice, you've, you've, you've heard this a bunch and really and truly, well, I'll tell you, so years ago I picked up a book I was on weightlifting, and the very first sentence of the book said, you do not need another book on exercise. What you need is the will to actually do it. And I thought, well, yeah, that, that's it right there. So I'm not buying this book. Um, <laughs> but today I, I want to talk about um, something called expectant living. Because as we've, we've, made, as we've made the first steps of connecting with those around us, You know, we have to figure out, well, what do we bring into this conversation? And what we bring into the conversation is confidence and hope into a world that desperately lacks it. I mean, here's the thing. No matter how many visits you make to your neighbors, no matter how much coffee you drink with them, no matter how many casseroles you bring over there, no matter how many neighborhood parties you might host... At the end of the day, the thing that makes you unique as a follower of Jesus is that you bring hope to every party. I want to back up just a little bit uh, for a few weeks. Maybe if you um, are old enough to remember this, I'm going to back up a little bit further than that. But but last month, we passed the 22nd anniversary of 9-11. And I take you back to that horrendous day in history because it's a good example of something that caused widespread disorientation. You see, on that day, what we had always thought, what we were always convinced of, what we had confidence in, turned out not to be true. The control that we thought we had disappeared like a morning mist and we were left gasping. I don't know anyone who wasn't impacted in one way or another that day, or who doesn't have a story about that day. And I, I guess we could also consider sort of the COVID pandemic at well, but as well, but that was, that was a little bit different. It was definitely disorienting, but, but it was different because it happened more slowly. 9-11 happened in the span of a few minutes. And the events of that day through us as a, as a nation, as, as individuals, because we never expected something like that to happen. Maybe we never thought we, we could be attacked. Maybe it was the way that it happened. Certainly in a community like ours where lots of people are connected to planes and airports and things like that. I mean, if you were a pilot during that time frame, there's a whole nother level of, of fear and anxiety and uncertainty that, that kind of gets layered on top. But the point is, is that we all arrived on this beautiful September morning, not expecting what happened to happen. I think we have the hardest time dealing with the unexpected. I mean, we try to prepare for it. Um, I mean, we, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in Florida, so we're always like pre-preparing for hurricanes and things like that. I mean, you try to ensure for the unexpected. And we think, and I think this is right at some level, that preparing for the unexpected might help us better able to handle whatever is coming our way. And yet I can tell you, after walking through impending deaths in my own family, things that we saw coming for a long time, that just knowing where we're headed doesn't always help. Maybe the shock is less, but the pain produced, the the feeling of having the world turn upside down, that doesn't change much. You see, we are creatures who find comfort and 
who find comfort in, in pattern and, and predictability, and when those patterns and predictability, that when it doesn't, doesn't prove to be true, even when we see what's coming, we struggle. Now, I'm telling you all this because in my experience, these moments of crisis, these moments when the unexpected happens, they are also the times when we have huge opportunity to connect to the people who are around us. Think back to 9-11 and the city of New York, a city that is famous for its you mind your business, I'll mind mine attitude, right? Right? I mean, you walk by people on the street, some of whom you see almost every day and never speak to them, never even acknowledge their presence. But suddenly, in the middle of a crisis, New York forgot all of that and strangers connected. If you know anything about Manhattan, many people travel in and out of the city on, on trains or otherwise. And that day, you couldn't get out of the city. Basically, people had to walk to get home. And shoe stores opened their doors and said, whatever you need, take it. There's no cost in the city of New York. When we lived in New Jersey, we lived about 30 miles from the coast. And when Hurricane Sandy hit, we were without power for almost two weeks. That was a fun adventure, let me tell you. But suddenly, we met neighbors that we'd literally never seen. All of a sudden, we are connected, and this crisis became the reason to share our combined experience and resources. But see, it doesn't have to be a big nationwide crisis or even a community-wide crisis for this to happen. Because you can also connect when things are smaller and more personal. I mean, maybe you hear that, that a neighbor has had a heart attack or has had surgery or that their, their child fell and broke their leg and is, is in the hospital. These are moments that are ripe for connection too. These are the everyday moments of opportunity for us. But, but here's the rub in those, those kind of smaller things because how often have you heard that a neighbor was, was sick and, and somehow in need and, and, and though your first thought was, you know what, I, I should reach out and help them. Your immediate second thought was, well, I don't want to bother them. Or they might, you know, not want me there. Or, this might be awkward because I don't really know what to say. Yeah, I get it. But my first point, and if you don't hear me say anything else today, is this. Just show up. As someone who has been engaging people who are in crisis for more than 25 years, I will tell you, just show up. Do not call. Do not ask for permission just show up. And you're probably thinking, but, 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 they might not want me there. It might be inconvenient. There might be something going on. I mean, there, I, mean I, I know, I have the same list in my own head, right? So learn to read the room. I mean, show up, and if there's a thousand things going on, say, hey, I love you, I just wanted you to know that, and back out of the room. That's all you really got to do. This isn't a social call. You're not going for, for dinner. I mean, don't treat it as that. You are there for one purpose, to act as a reminder. This person is loved. God is still with them. And I am physically going to stand here with you as that reminder as long as you let me and as long as you need me. I'm going to stand here as a physical reminder of an unshakable truth. 
Now see, that last part of what I said might be the hardest part of what I said because when I say show up as a physical reminder of the goodness of God and the unshakability of the kingdom of God, even in the middle of a crisis moment, I want to be clear that when you show up, you are not showing up to be helpful or wise or to fix the problem or to somehow bring resolution and solution to a problem that probably has no resolution or solution. You are there for the other person. And all those action items that I just mentioned are probably more about you than they are the other person. When we show up for our neighbors who are in crisis, we have to put ourselves aside and the only thing we bring with us is steadfast hope. Now, I'm not saying casseroles or cards or offers to walk the dog or clean the house or all those things. I'm not saying they're not helpful. They are, and they should be offered if, if that is something that is possible and it is something that is needed by the other person. But the real gift to any kind of, in any kind of crisis is hope. And for us as Christians, hope is very unique. It comes from having a vision which extends beyond the present. Now, I want to look at a passage this morning from 1 Peter. I really could have chosen multiple passages because that basically all lead in the same direction, but, but I liked this one, so bear with me here. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, I'm going to read down through verse 9. Listen to the word of the Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is, be, that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, maybe you are new to church or you are new to the scriptures. You've never heard this passage before. But if you've been around a church once or twice, if you've read the Bible, you might be familiar with this passage. And of course, what we're working with here is an English translation of a Greek passage. And so what the translators do is they make word choices and then they try to smooth the whole thing out in English because, you know, I understand. But what I want you to hear is sort of a rough version of the English translation, because within it, I think you can hear the source of hope which, which you bring wherever you go. And so this is sort of what it sounds like. Blessed be the God and Father of the Master of us, Jesus the Anointed, who, according to his vast mercy, is up-generating, that's worth the birthing, but up-generating us into what? Expectation living. Don't you love that? He's up-generating us into expectation living. We have this expectation living because or through the upstanding of Jesus, the anointed among the dead ones. That's resurrection there. But don't you love that? The upstanding of Jesus among the dead ones? He's also up-generating us into a tenancy, which is uncorruptible, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven into you or for you. Now, for me, this is so good because it is clear that Jesus and his mercy is, is creating within us a way to live in expectation, and we can live in expectation because of what? The resurrection. Now, let's be clear, the res resurrection has already happened as far as Jesus is concerned. It's in, it's in the past, 
But this event allows us to see the present and the future in a very, very different way. And this passage continues, and it reminds us that through Jesus, because of his Jesus upstanding among the dead ones, we know that we have a tenancy. Now, isn't that an interesting word? The Bible uses the word inheritance. Inheritance is a beautiful word, but the problem with inheritance from my perspective is, is it sounds a little conditional, doesn't it? It might happen. It might not. Someone might change the will. They might not. But a tenancy, a tenancy, a right to occupy is tangible. It is real. It is present. And our right to occupy is not changeable. It isn't broken. It's not going to go stale. It's real and stable and unmovable. And even more than that, this tenancy, this right to occupy is ours. And God is protecting those of us with faith until this tenancy comes to fulfillment someday in the future. All of this is the reason for the hope that we have. All of this underlies what we bring into a conversation or presence with someone who is in crisis. I don't think anyone with faith and who understands a little bit about what Jesus has done and is doing is going to disagree with that. But the one thing that I think is so important to look at here is, is when you look closer to, into this passage, you can see that you can even suffer grief, which I read as a brokenness from sadness. You can suffer brokenness from sa sadness, and you know what changes? Nothing. Nothing. It's still there. The tendency is still there. It isn't going to change. The resurrection is still there. It isn't going to change. What Jesus has given us through his mercy is always going to be there. If you are the one who is suffering and are crushed in spirit, it can certainly feel like things have changed. The Lord isn't present, but it just isn't true. I mean, think about what Paul says in Romans. Nothing separates us from the love of God in Jesus. See, it's this unshakable hope in, in Christ because of Christ, which we bring into every situation, especially when we walk into like a, a crisis moment with other people. And I have said this to so many people over the years. We need each other in times of grief. We have to stand up because sometimes people cannot stand up for their own, on their own. They're so heartbroken that they have just completely forgotten gotten the promises of God. This is one of the reasons that I think it's so important for people to show up for memorial services and funerals. I, I know culturally what has happened over the years with, with these kind of services, they've become sort of like, well, you almost have to have an invitation to them, right? If I don't know the person, then, then why would I be there? Because you're a believer in the resurrection. And because you can stand up when somebody else can't. Because they are so heartbroken, they don't even understand what's going on anymore. And so understand that, that this is so important, but it also has to be done very, very carefully. It has to be done slowly and always with love of the other person in mind. In Proverbs chapter 25, it says, Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on a wound, who is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. This is extremely important counsel with working with neighbors or anyone who is suffering, especially if you don't know what their faith is. When we bring hope into a situation many times, the hope that we bring, it's not exactly unspoken, but it is less reflected in words than it is in the way we hold our own souls. Have you ever been in that circumstance, maybe overheard somebody is talking to somebody who is in terrible grief and you realize they're preaching a sermon to them and you think to yourself, please stop. Please stop. In crisis, 
we have to be willing to accept the pain the other person is in. And it's so hard to do. But you have to be willing and able to just stand there sometimes. There may be a place to speak the words of the kingdom to someone who is suffering, but most often what happens is is that you just have to operate out of your own conviction rather than, than use this moment of crisis to try and convince someone of the goodness and unshakable nature of the kingdom of heaven in that moment. I mean, think about it this way. We are commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves, and so the question always is, is what would you want? What would you want? What would love look like right now? And a lot of times, most of the times, it's just presence. Just be there. I had to learn that lesson. And it is a hard lesson to learn because most often when people are in crisis, well... How comfortable are you with people who are in crisis? And what do we do? I'm going to make sure that you feel better. So I'm going to say 14 things that are going to make you feel better. Because you know why? Because I'm so uncomfortable with your pain right now. That I'm going to make myself feel better by making you feel better. And it just doesn't work. The greatest gift you can give someone is to learn to just stay in the pain with them. Love them in the middle of it. Carry hope in the middle of it. But listen to what Proverbs says. Do not sing songs to a heavy heart. Instead, sit, wait, listen, be still and solid in your faith and your conviction that God will redeem this, that there is an ultimate plan that is moving beyond and through this. And you may never form those words. Those words may never leave your lips, but you will carry them in your heart because the hope of the gospel is the most important thing. Would you pray with me? Lord, once again, we We come before you and we are grateful for our neighbors, for those that you that you call us um, to serve and to love and to know. And I pray, Lord, that that when those moments of need come, that we would be willing to simply be a physical reminder of your love of your goodness and of your kindness. Help us, Lord, to to remain steadfast in our conviction and our hope that comes through the resurrection of Jesus. And so we keep all of this, Lord, in the front of our hearts in the front of our minds and ask, Lord, that um, we would just be good ambassadors of your kingdom. We pray this in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. As we enter into our giving time, I just want to share an invitation with you to consider how you might give of your time your talents, and your treasures, knowing what God has done for you. And so will you join me as we pray and give thanks to God for all that he has given us? Father, we thank you and we praise you for how generous you have been to us. We thank you for your goodness and for all of the gifts that we have received. And so we pray that as we give back towards you and towards our neighbors and to seeing your kingdom unveiled before our very eyes, we pray that your name would be made great, that your kingdom would be shown, and that your will would be done. So we pray blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Let's stand and worship one more time, shall we? question for you. Where's your hope? Where's your confidence? Because that is the thing that you're carrying with you everywhere you go. In every interaction, friends, family, neighbors. So carry the confidence that Jesus does reign. He is king. He is on your side. He loves you more than you could ever know. As you go out and encounter the world, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and in you today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Jesus, every heart and tongue confess your name. Every